Hello everyone, uh, thank you very much for tuning in. Um, let me uh, start with um, extending my uh, gratitude uh, to the Dean of the Faculty of English, Professor Jana Pawelczyk. I would also like to thank Dr. Katarzyna uh, Jankowiak and Magister Benjamin Kwaniecki uh, for uh, their support throughout uh, the week. Um, I feel really honored to be part of um, this uh, event and this initiative. Um, you can see the title of my presentation uh, on the slide. And you can also see that this lecture is an offshoot of an ongoing um, project financed, financed by the National uh, Science Center. Uh, and the project is devoted to um, an investigation of pregnant characters in English early modern drama. And my today's lecture uh, is also about uh, pregnancy and pregnant characters in uh, English early modern uh, drama. Let me start with a very famous quotation. Now is the winter of our discontent. Now is the winter of our discontent. This is an opening um, line of Shakespeare's Richard III. Uh, Richard III is a haunting history play or a tragedy that documents um, a rise and fall of a bloody tyrant. And although this line is in the play spoken by Richard himself, um, it becomes an invitation uh, to Richard's fantasy of self-fashioning um, from a despised, deformed, and seemingly insignificant um, member of his brother's court to a tyrannous king. However, I believe that uh, in its aphoristic and typically Shakespearean uh, aptness, uh, this quotation also captures perfectly captures the mood in Poland at the closing of 2020. And indeed, thousands of uh, Poles uh, are marching across the country. They are going to the streets to express their discontent. Though uh, one might say that they are definitely using stronger words than discontent. What the protesters oppose is what they believe a tyrannous law. Mm, yet again, within uh, a span of just a couple of years, female reproductive rights um, emerge at the center of the Polish political arena. When I was preparing this presentation, I did not suspect that the political climate in Poland would be um, such. Um, when I first conceptualized the plan of this lecture, I definitely did not um, suspect that women, uh, women's bodies and their bodily integrity would once again uh, become the currency in a social and political battle. However, historically, um, women have always been uh, hostages of discriminatory religious, social and political discourses that would shape them as inferior, as less than, uh, incapable of yielding authority over their bodies or anything else for that matter. And at the heart of these discourses was, of course, the reproductive potential. So women were owned rather than owning objects rather than uh, subjects. And um, when we think about early modern women, uh, they were seen as vessels um, gestating new life, but not really creating it. Female reproductive powers in uh, the early modern period um, were then vilified and feared, venerated and minimized at the same uh, time. So today, uh, what I wish to do is to reread um, selected characters uh, from early modern drama. Mm, I will be looking at uh, one Shakespearean character um, in detail, and uh, also another Websterian character, uh, a character from a play uh, by uh, Shakespeare's near contemporary John Webster. I will be close reading um, selected scenes uh, from um, Shakespeare's Richard III and Henry VI Part III, but I will also be supporting my argumentation looking at um, examples from other Shakespearean texts uh, like Macbeth or uh, King Lear. The second part of my um, lecture will be devoted to uh, the Duchess of Malfi and her transformed pregnant embodiment, and I will talk a little bit about uh, the fluidity of uh, pregnancy.
I hope it has already become uh, evident uh, or it will become evident that I will be speaking about Shakespeare, but what I wish to do is also to build bridges between um, early modern and modern conceptualizations of uh, pregnant embodiment. So let me start with uh, Richard III. Uh, Richard III uh, was a historical king. He was the last Plantagenet king. He was defeated at the Battle of Bosworth in 1485 by Henry Tudor. And with his death, the War of the Roses, um, the most um, uh, bloody, the bloodiest and uh, the longest dynastic uh, feud in English history finally ended. Henry uh, Tudor uh, was crowned as Henry VII and he started a new uh, dynasty, uh, Tudor dynasty. And the last representative of this um, dynasty was Elizabeth I, and she was on the throne when Shakespeare wrote his play. And I think uh, that we all know that Shakespeare can be credited with the creation of the most uh, famous portrayal, portrayal of the last Plantagenet uh, king. Um, Shakespeare followed um, Thomas More um, uh, Thomas More's history of Richard III and other Renaissance historians, Hall and Hollinshed. And uh, in Tudor um, history, Richard III uh, emerges as a truly obnoxious and monstrous uh, figure. And Shakespeare's presentation is no different. Um, in um, Shakespeare's play, uh, Richard himself is uh, very acutely aware of his bodily difference. By Renaissance standard, he standard he is um, deformed. Um, however, um, he manages to claw his way to the throne through cunning mach machinations and uh, murder. And in the very beginning of uh, the play, uh, in uh, in the opening of the play, uh, this is what he says: "But I, that am not shaped for sportive tricks, nor made to court an amorous-looking glass, I." that am rudely stamped, I, that am curtailed of this fur proportion, cheated of feature by descending nature, deformed, unfinished, sent before my time into this breathing world, scarce half made up. And that's so lamely and fashionable that dogs bark me and as I hold by them. Um, what immediately springs to uh, my attention is the phrase sent before uh, my time, which um, clearly refers to Richard's premature birth, which was um, in the period an ominous uh, sign, but it was also a highly dangerous uh, occurrence for both the mother and uh, the child. Throughout the play, um, it becomes uh, evident that uh, Richard is defined by the monstrous circumstances of uh, his birth. Uh, what would nowadays be defined as uh, disability in an early modern play uh, has a moral significance. So Richard's deformity reflects his moral shortcomings. So his out, uh, outside appearance demonstrates um, his uh, sinful nature. Since his body is misshapen, so must be um, his mind as well. And um, Richard's opening speech uh, becomes his villain's credo. Uh, but it also painfully unveils um, another idea. It unveils the idea of disability as a social construct, since it is clear um, that it is the world that would not accept uh, Richard as uh, he is. He, has, he says himself that courtly entertainments or sports are not for him, um, because they are reserved for the bodies that fit the normative um, social framework. This um, pre-modern conflation of, um, uh, of bodily difference and um, moral failings is, is a very insidious uh, idea and it's, it's a very dangerous idea because it carries across the ages. And in my slide you can see a selection of um, pop uh, culture uh, villains and you can see that all of them are in one way or uh, another um, disfigured. Um, so this cursory look at modern pop culture villain uh, demonstrates the same uh, bias. Very often, physical difference becomes a mark of villainy. However, what I want to focus today um, on is uh, Richard's genius ability to tap into the well of early modern prejudice against women and their physiology. 
Um, Richard manages to take advantage, advantage of his um, monstrous birth and push the responsibility for his crimes um, and his hatred to the world onto the women who surround him. For example, showing his withered and crippled arm, uh, arm uh, he says, Then be your eyes the witness of the evil. Look how I am bewitched. Behold, my arm is like a blasted suppling, withered up. And this is Edward's wife, that monstrous witch consorted with that harlot's trumpet shore, that by their witchcraft thus have marked me. Richard is referring to witchcraft, and of course fears of witchcraft are still rife in the early modern period, with, for instance, um, King James even writing a book um, on the persecution of uh, witches. However, what is less immediately um, critically recognized is the link between the belief in malevolent female powers and women's role as mothers and immediate carers on whom men are very often dependent or almost always uh, dependent. Uh, Richard's um, fury is then directed at his um, brother's wife, Edward's wife, and uh, his uh, late brother's um, mistress. However, indirectly, he also throws um, an accusation at his own mother, uh, a woman that brought him into uh, this uh, world. And this is, of course, a, a cunning ploy to divert our attention uh, from um, his own sins, from, from his evil uh, deeds. And it, it is also um, a very... Um, um, it is a very cunning manipulation because we know and the audience knows that um, Richard has not been made like this um, by uh, women who surround him, but he was born this way. And um, I think it is, it is important for us to uh, go back to the circumstances of Richard's uh, birth. Um, and um, in order to do that, we need to uh, go back to a different Shakespearean text. Um, uh, so we need to uh, look at Henry VI, Part Three, uh, where we also have the character of uh, Richard. Uh, in this play, um, Henry VI um, uh, says the following words. The owl shrieked at thy birth, an evil sign. The night crow cried, a boding luckless time. Dogs howled and hideous tempest shook down trees. Thy mother felt more than a mother's pain, yet brought forth less than a mother's hope. To wit, an indigested and deformed lump, not like the fruit of such a goodly tree. Teeth hadst thou in thy head when thou wast born, to signify thou comest to bite the world. And if the rest be true which I have heard, thou comest he cannot finish this speech because he is stabbed by um, Richard. And what I would like you to do is to push the inventory of these scary and ominous signs like um, shrieking owls um, and howling dogs and hideous tempest, and instead focus on something that we can also hear in this speech. Because what we can hear, I think, is the cry of the mother in the throes of labor pains. And these uh, pains are more excruciating than uh, would normally be expected. What we have before our eyes is also the shock and the pain of a woman who has given birth to what Henry puts as less than a mother's hope. The early modern uh, scant yet existing collections of prayers or loose reflections uh, written down by aristocratic women clearly demonstrate that what women uh, feared the most, of course, next to the pain of labor itself, was giving birth to a deformed child. So what I think um, here, um, we also hear um, this, this fear, um, that um, the, the fear uh, or, or the shock that comes with um, giving birth to a uh, child that is um, sick. Richard um, continues his, um, his speech, um, and um, uh, his, his continuation is also a recollection of uh, the birth, and um, um, he recalls the horror that was shared by the midwife and other birth attendants. Um, so um, let me read the fragment uh, um, again for you. For I have often heard my mother say, 
I came into the world with my legs forward. Had I not reason, think you, to make haste and seek the ruin that usurped our right? The midwife wonder, wondered, and the women cried, Oh, Jesus, bless us, he is born with teeth. And so I was, which plainly signified that I should snarl and bite and play the dog. Then, since the heavens have shaped my body so, let hell make crooked my mind to answer it. So Richard's own continuation of um, Henry's um, recollection of the birth, um, as I said, recalls the, the horror that was shared by the midwife and other birth uh, attendants. What Richard also refers to is something that we nowadays call a bridge delivery, where the baby comes bottom first rather than uh, head first. And in the early modern reality uh, in which a cesarean section was not possible, a breech delivery required a skilled midwife uh, to attempt to change the baby's uh, position manually. However, if that failed, um, a woman was faced with a potentially fatal and exceptionally grueling um, labor. Uh, Richard what, what, also, what Richard also presents um, to us in his uh, speech is um, a wrong belief uh, that it was mostly a baby's role uh, to actively fight its way out of the vaginal passage. Um, early modern um, male doctors and authors of midwifery books very often minimized the role of um, laboring women. Um, they preferred to present uh, laboring women as passive objects taken over by the forces of uh, nature. Um, and here, um, in these uh, images, um, you can see um, the so-called fetal positions. I mean, what you can see is almost semi-independent fetuses looking more like um, adult men rather than uh, children um, who sort of push um, to exit um, the, uh, the mother's uh, womb. Um, what Richard does in his speech is also confirm the aforementioned social stigma that is attached to um, his birth. He clearly says that since his birth was unnatural, um, since his body is misshapen, then his mind must also be um, twisted. Richard III is, um, is, 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 is an incredible text um, because um, in this text, uh, we can also hear the voices of women. And um, if we go back to the tragedy of uh, Richard III, we actually get a chance to um, listen to the women whose um, suffering Richard very often is blind to and deaf to. Um, there is a scene where uh, Richard is hurrying to a deci decisive battle that would either make him or break him. Um, and he is stopped by uh, a group of women uh, one of these uh, women is his mother, and um, the mother asks, Art thou so hasty? I have stayed for thee, God knows, in torment and in agony. What the Duchess clearly uh, refers to um, is the horrid labor that brought Richard uh, forth. And what Richard very naively um, says is, And came I not at last to comfort you? And to this, um, she very decisively answers, No, by the holy rood, thou knowest it well. Thou comest on earth to make the earth my hell. A grievous burden was thy birth to me. Tetchy and wayward was thy infancy. Thy school days frightful, desperate, wild and furious. Thy prime of manhood, daring, bold and venturous. What comfortable hour canst thou name that ever graced me with thy company? What the Duchess does is she renounces her own son, and her disavowal of her own son is supposed to be, um, of course, the measure of Richard's evil. So, so apprehensive and so abhorrent are Richard's crimes that even his own mother uh, renounces him. Yet, I would argue that on another level, this is also a complaint of a woman that has been broken by the curse and the pains and the demands of the most challenging motherhood that one can imagine. Her pain has not stopped with Richard's birth. 
quite the opposite. Um, it festered through uh, the years, through the long years of looking at Richard battling the world, battling his hatred to the world, um, to the world that would never, ever accept him as he is. That Richard's hatred would materialize into um, disdain towards those who occasion the births of um, monsters like him comes to me as no surprise. Um, in, a, in a culture that defines masculinity as violent powers and also um, this sort of mystified physical self-sufficiency, acknowledging maternal origin and acknowledging maternal uh, dependence is basically unacceptable. Hatred towards those in whose arms boys and later men feel vulnerable comes easily. And this idea has been illustrated um, in, for instance, Janet Adelman's um, seminal book, Suffocating Mothers, where she very poignantly argues that patriarchal masculinity needs a brutal denial of the maternal origin for its self-definition. And we have many examples of this idea uh, in Shakespeare's uh, works. So, for instance, in, in a fantasy of his second birth, Richard hews his way out with a bloody axe. Um, Macduff is invulnerable to Macbeth's sword because he's not one of woman born. Uh, Macduff was from his mother's womb untimely ripped, which is obviously a, a, a reference to um, a cesarean section um, performed by an already uh, dead woman. So it is understood that Macduff was not born of a woman because he was taken out of the body of a woman that was already dead. And Macduff sort of emerges as this impossible masculinist fantasy of self-sufficient, independent male, free from maternal influence and from maternal uh, dependence. There are more examples of a similar uh, idea. Um, if we look at King Lear, this seemingly poor man who is more sinned against than um, sinning, when he is met with opposition from his daughters, he curses Goneril by saying, Suspend thy purpose if thou didst intend to make this creature fruitful. If she must deem, create her child of spleen, that it may live and be athwart this nature torment to her. Let it stamp wrinkles in her brow of youth with cadent tears fret channels in her cheeks. Turn all her mother's pains and benefits to laughter and contempt that she may feel how sharper than a serpent's tooth it is to have a thankless child. Away, away. Leah, I would argue, clearly hits where it hurts, hurts the most. He knows that the worst thing that can ever happen to a mother is to live to see her child suffer, is to live to see her child die and turn all her maternal energies to dust. Um, he also knows that if one cannot free from the depend dependence on women, if one cannot shape the maternal influence, the least what one can do is to curse it to unimaginable torment, and this is exactly what he does. So we need to ask ourselves a question, what is left when these brutal fantasies of um, male sufficiency are enacted? Uh, in King Lear, an apocalyptic vision of chaos is unleashed, and it leaves a hollow and morally empty uh, desert in its aftermath. Mm, John Webster's uh, The Duchess of Malfi um, paints a very similar vision, I think, in its final act, because um, when the title Duchess dies, having been first tortured and later murdered on the orders of uh, her brothers, everything seems to disintegrate, the very heart and soul of, of this tragedy is extinguished uh, and the tragedy descends into utter darkness. However, before this happens, um, Webster, Shakespeare's younger fellow dramatist, um, offers us a compelling and powerful image of a tragic heroine. He gives us a tragedy with a woman at its, at it, at, at its heart. Um, and on top of that, he gives us a tragic heroine who is a female monarch, a female monarch in her own right, a wife, a mother, 
and a very sensual and courageous um, woman. And what I would like to do is to spend the remaining um, couple of minutes discussing um, this amazing play. Um, and this way focus also on a more uh, female-centered um, perspective, albeit it must be uh, said also written um, by a man. Uh, the early um, the, the the Duchess of Malfi um, is, um, as I said, um, a, a duchess. She is a monarch in uh, her her own right, and she is also a young widow. Uh, and uh, as such, uh, she is um, an object of virulent misogyny because um, in the early modern uh, period, widows were believed to um, be um, lustful and unreliable. And very often um, the way um, this uh, misogyny is explained is by um, this very idea that widows um, emerge as very subversive figures. Um, because um, when you think about early modern patriarchy, um, you think of virgins and young women who are subject to the authority of their fathers. And you also think about wives who are the subject to the authority of their husbands. And Widows um, are somewhere in, in the middle. They are subversive because they don't have to answer to uh, men. Um, and um, what I find particularly fascinating about this uh, text is that um, uh, in the play, the Duchess uh, marriage, uh, mar marries secretly and um, uh, she um, uh, becomes pregnant and uh, she throughout the play she has uh, three pregnancies she gives birth to three children and she manages to keep um, her marriage and her subsequent pregnancies uh, secret um, and um, when you th if you think if you think that this is stuff that is so unrealistic that it can only belong to um, the world of early modern drama hold your horses uh, because this story is actually based on an actual account um, and actual life of, of an Italian duchess who managed to do just that. Um, she uh, married for love and um, she managed to keep her uh, marriage secret for um, some time and she also managed to keep her pregnancies uh, secret before she was found out and most probably uh, killed by her brothers. Um, and. Um, uh, she and, and this story became uh, a, an instant scandal in Renaissance Europe and it inspired um, several historical and artistic accounts and John Webster's um, tragedy is one of um, uh, such uh, accounts. Mm, what I would like us to uh, look is uh, one uh, famous scene from the play uh, which is uh, very often called apricot scene. Um, this is a scene uh, where the Duchess emerges on stage heavily pregnant and her pregnant um, embodiment is communicated through the words of her servant spy, Bosola. And uh, Webster showers his audience with uh, numerous pregnancy indicators um, uh, and, and Bosola very obsessively catalogues these um, uh, pregnancy indicators in order to uh, unveil the Duchess's um, condition. Um, so, for, in for instance, we learn that the Duchess is wearing a loose gown. Um, she admits herself that uh, her mo mobility is limited. She is short-winded. She is also ravenously um, hungry, so she has these uh, food um, cravings. Um, and uh, in Bosola's words, um, uh, we learn from Bosola's words, we learn: "I observe our Duchess is sick a days. She pukes." Her stomach sees, the fins of her eyelids look most teeming blue, she wanes in the cheek and waxes fat in the flank, and contrary to her Italian fashion, wears a loose-bodied gown. There's somewhat in it. Uh, Bosola is indeed a very um, keen observer, uh, so uh, he uh, spots these most obvious pregnancy uh, symptoms like morning sickness, weight gain, and the bluish color of uh, eyelids. However, if we uh, take this set of um, symptoms and consult it with uh, uh, early modern medical uh, books, we, very, uh, we, we can learn that these are uh, true uh, pregnancy indicators, but we also learn that uh, these uh, symptoms might also indicate uh, disease. And what I'm trying to say is that the true nature of the Duchess's embodiment can only be fathomed by her. 
Um, in the case of the Duchess, um, very uh, subtle differences between disease symptoms or pregnancy can only be known through direct experience of the pregnant uh, embodiment. For this reason, Bosola may observe um, these outward signs, but he can never really um, uncover their meaning. It is only through um, an unwarranted attack on um, the Duchess's bodily autonomy that uh, he learns something. Uh, what Bosola does is um, he takes advantage of uh, the Duchess's fatigue and the Duchess's uh, hunger, and he offers her apricots. And um, uh, what is important for you to know is that in the early modern period, um, it was believed that raw fruit, um, so apricots included, um, uh, raw fruit could, uh, could um, cause a miscarriage and it was considered dangerous uh, for pregnant women. And in the play, what happens is that the Duchess is actually driven into uh, labor, into premature uh, labor. So Bosola learns something, something um, happens. Uh, however, um, uh, uh, we will come back to uh, this uh, in a second. Uh, what I would like us uh, to focus on for a moment is uh, the Duchess herself. Um, because I believe that um, none of the early modern pregnant heroines seem to capture this um, um, seeming contradictions and transform, uh, transformative fluidity of the pregnant embodiment like um, the Duchess. Because in this scene, throughout this scene, she herself recognizes her limited mobility and she recognizes her spherical uh, shape and its limitations. Um, so um, she herself, for example, worries about uh, her shape. Um, she herself admits that um, uh, she uh, is short-winded, as she says herself. Um, however, the important thing is that um, none of these symptoms ever stop her from performing um, her usual business of ruling. Um, what, is, what seems to be um, the problem is the structure and organization of her court. And let us have a look at um, uh, one quotation. Um, in this, uh, this is actually a continuation of the same scene, and um, uh, the Duchess first um, wishes um, help, uh, wants help from uh, one of her attendants, and she uh, calls for the attendant and says, come hither, mend my ruff. And if you wish to know what a ruff is, um, it's, enough for, uh, it's, it's enough for you to have a look at um, uh, the picture. Um, here's an early modern uh, woman, pregnant and wearing um, a very excessive ruff. Uh, mend my ruff, here, when, thou art such a tedious lady, and thy breath smells of lemon pills. Wouldst thou hadst done, shall I swoon under thy fingers? I am so troubled with the mother. Um, the Duchess um, cannot stand the odour of uh, her uh, attendant, because apparently she is super sensitive to smells, which is of course one of um, uh, pregnancy symptoms uh, as well. Uh, but, uh, again, I would like to come back to the same idea. It's not the Duchess who is the problem here, but rather uh, her uh, attendants and her court that does not know about her condition and fails to uh, acknowledge this condition and fails to adapt to this condition. So, in other words, um, a loose-bodied gown will not really help you if you're still wearing uh, such an excessive uh, ruff. Your mobility will still um, be um, limited. Um, some critics argue that in this scene, in the apricot scene, Webster comes very close to embracing these negative attitudes towards pregnancy that were prevalent in the period. Um, so, um, in, the, in the quotation that I uh, read um, a second ago, um, you, you also um, see that the Duchess herself identifies her body as diseased by referring to the so-called mother, the mother. And the mother is a widow's affliction of the wandering womb, uh, in other words, um, hysteria. However, I argue that Webster actually normalizes the Duchess, uh, Duchess's pregnancy uh, and he normalizes the Duchess's pregnant embodiment. Um, the Duchess um, subscribes her body momentarily to the realm of disease, uh, but she does that for the sake of secrecy. And as I said, she never 
is stopped by her condition uh, from performing her normal functions, even for a moment. So she keeps on ruling, um, she keeps on making decisions uh, regarding uh, the organization of uh, her court, she um, eats as she pleases, um, she is her usual self. Um, what Bosola at one point says is, I should have discovered, apparently, the young Springle cutting a caper in her belly. Um, I argue that, like so many authors of midwifery uh, books, Bosola imagines the fetus as a separate, almost independent being, ready to exit the mother's womb at any point. Um, and it is enough to once again look at uh, the uh, the drawings from um, one of the mid famous midwifery books. Um, uh, these are um, the drawings from Thomas Reinald's Birth of Mankind. Um, and I see many parallels between Bosola's man midwife's wild imagination and uh, the imagination of the medical writers of uh, the age. Uh, Reinald, as I already pointed out, um, sees um, these fetuses, of course only male fetuses, looking more like fully formed men than babies. And these fully formed men are uh, at all um, moments ready to exit the mother's uh, womb. And they sort of, if you take these images together, they all, they all sort of um, take these athletic postures and, um, uh, and and they are far more elaborate than um, the postures that um, actual fetuses uh, can take in mother's uh, wombs. And again, taken together, um, these male fetuses sort of look like they are dancing. So um, they very strongly resemble the young Springle cutting a caper in the Duchess's um, belly. Um, the vision that the early modern midwifery books, um, written by male authors, um, uh, and Bosola's vision, um, uh, is, is very much different uh, from what early modern women uh, felt themselves. As Gowing very um, persuasively argues, for an early modern woman, the fetus in the womb was felt as a mass of tissue and blood, only of the quickening, and not always then, did it approach the status of unborn child. So um, Bosola's vision reflects this um, ever um, popular um, sense of the fetus's independence of the mother um, uh, developing in the early modern uh, medical discourse. Um, however, the actual experience of early modern women is somewhat different. And um, I would argue that despite the fact that the Duchess is driven into premature labor because of Bosola's unwarranted attack on uh, the autonomy and integrity of her body, at the end of this scene, he is left no wiser. So um, she, she indeed, indeed is um, uh, taken off stage and um, she is in labor, but um, Bosola is left alone on stage and he does not know if the Duchess is indeed sick, as all the courtiers are led to believe. Um, he is not sure if she had not been poisoned. Um, so despite his act reading of all the pregnancy symptoms, uh, pregnancy emerges as an elusive, fluid condition that is almost impossible to detect. And the only person who has a privileged access to her own bodily experience is the Duchess herself. So on top of all the subversive things that Webster is um, telling us, um, things like, uh, you know, um, a woman being able to uh, be uh, a monarch in her own uh, right, a, right, a woman um, enjoying um, sensual pleasures, I think Webster is also sending us um, one more important message. And this is a message that I think modern women in certain places of the world uh, still have to reiterate over and over again. And this message is, it's her body, it's her choice. And of course, the Duchess pays a very heavy price for experiencing the right, for, sorry, for exercising the right to her bodily freedom. So her husband is killed, she, uh, her children are slaughtered, um, she is tortured and eventually is uh, killed by, um, by a Bosola. 
And of course, early modern texts abound in gruesome images of women suffering uh, at the hands of men. Um, and yet, I think we cannot um, treat, um, it's not that I think it, I'm sure, we cannot um, read these texts as some sick uh, warnings, keep your place or else. Uh, rather, texts like the Duchess uh, of Malfi offer us images of assertive, forceful women who strive to have full existences despite the stifling circumstances um, that refuse to recognize their basic humanity. As means of a conclusion, I wish to come back to Richard III for just a moment. I would like to um, uh, read you a fragment from this self styled manifesto that uh, Richard gives us. Richard says, Since I cannot prove a lover to entertain these fair, well-spoken days, I am determined to prove a villain, and hate the idle pleasure of these days. Plots have I laid, inductions dangerous, by drunken prophecies, libels and dreams. And as I was rereading the text for the purpose of this lecture, I couldn't free myself from an image of one modern-day misogynist. A manipulative, supposedly genius strategist who has time and again proven himself a villain to us. An image of a man so often laughed at, mocked and not treated seriously enough, who nevertheless managed to grab the reins of power and brought a whole country to its knees. In Shakespeare's plays, it's the women, mothers who are forced to endure the suffering of their own children, who stop Richard in his tracks and prophesize his imminent downfall. And if we are to trust Shakespeare, we should remember that all tyrants eventually fall. Thank you very much uh, for uh, your attention. I will leave you just with a thank you note and a slide with my reference. Thank you very much.